Good morning, everybody. Lovely to see you all. Um, we are here to discuss the gene machine. My name's Ganesh Taylor, I'm your host, and I'm not going to be doing very much because of these two gentlemen on either side of me. So with no further ado, Dawkins' selfish gene has been hugely influential, both within evolutionary biology and the wider public sphere. It is a beautiful, simple story that genes and not organisms drive evolutionary change. But critics argue the story is simplistic. The effect of a gene is not always the same and uh, is dependent on its host and the cell environment. Dennis Noble, a pioneer of systems bio uh, biology, goes further arguing that the organism and not genes are in fact in charge. So Dennis, as you probably already know anyway, is a, is a world-renowned biologist and professor emeritus of cardiovascular physiology at the University of Oxford. He's famous for developing the first ever mathematical model of cardiac cells in 1960. His most groundbreaking book, The Music of Life, was the first work in the field of systems biology. To my left, of course, is Richard Dawkins, who is a biologist and best-selling author. He is one of the most famous scientists in the world, uh, but you don't need me to tell you that. Anyway, with good reason, his 1976 uh, work, The Selfish Gene, was the first ever real blockbuster popular science book, shaping how we have all understood evolution and where we come from. And since then, of course, he's written uh, numerous other bestsellers, including The Blind uh, Watchmaker, The God Delusion, and Climbing Mount Improbable. So I'm going to sit back and, and let you two take it away. I, I approach this with some trepidation because um, Dennis Noble was actually my doctoral examiner. <laughs> 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 Richard, we're in the chair again. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm somewhat nervous. I hope I pass today. <laughs> um, I would like to um, ask you to ignore all that was said about the selfish gene <laughs> Feel uh, free. earlier. To me, the argument today is about one paragraph in Dennis's excellent book, Dance to the Tune of Life, uh, which is a wonderful book, um, except that it's wrong. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, the table's turn. Um, the, the sentence, well, the paragraph concerned is, is this book will show that there are no genes for anything. Living organisms have functions which use genes to make the molecules they need. Genes are used. They are not active causes. Now, I think that's a wonderful sentence because although it's wrong, it's clear. It's absolutely clear and open and uh, articulate and that makes my job relatively easy um, because I want to show that the exact opposite is true. Um, the truth is, is opposite. Genes use individuals, use organisms as tools for their own propagation. If Dennis is right, then I've been wrong for 50 years and so have actually most of the people now working in the field um, uh, studying animals in Africa and, and wh wh where the, the kind of assumption is that organisms are working to propagate the genes that, uh, that drive them. Now, I'm, I'm not saying for a moment that other things in the organism are unimportant. The, the rhetoric of Dennis's book, I think, is wonderful. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful evocation of the... Um, the unity of the organism, the fact that all the parts are working together as a system. Um, what is wrong, however, is the view that genes are used in a way he's implying that when this cell needs to make a protein, it goes into the nucleus and consults the library, which is the genome, and takes down the volume relevant to the enzyme that's needed. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and this is, the w this is the one we need. We, we need to make this protein. Let's get the relevant gene out and use it. Um, that that, that yeah. is Dennis's view. He's nodding vigorously. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, Absolutely. <laughs> I have no problem with that as a 
physiologist, Dennis is a physiologist, or is, or is an embryologist for that matter. That is indeed what happens. But as an evolutionist, what matters is that genes are causal agents. Contradicting Dennis's statement, um, they are not active causes, they are active causes in the following. Well, I perhaps I better shut up and let. Should, should I sort of. Um, no, I mean, sh shall I fi finish your okay, point? Okay, I'll, I'll just finish my right. yeah, sure. point. Yes. Um, no, how, how do we ever recognize a cause? Well, I think the answer is this we do an experiment, we manipulate. You cannot show that something's a cause unless you manipulate. And it's a very trivial example. Suppose you have a, a hypothesis that a cock crows every time a church clock um, tolls. tolls. So you, you observe a correlation that the, 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 the clock tolls and the, and the cock crows. <laughs> Now, is, the, is, is it causal? The only way to be sure is to do an experiment. Climb up into the clock tower and change the clock or manipulate the clock. Ideally, make the clock toll at random. And then, if the cock crows, uh, then you've shown a causal link. In the case of genes, we know that if you, were to, if you mutate a gene, then it will change the phenotype more importantly for an evolutionist, that change will go on to the next generation and the next and the next and the next and potentially forever. Um, whereas if you change anything else, no matter how important it may be causally in the embryology of the animal, if you break a leg, circumcise a penis, do anything else, it will not be transmitted into future generations. And that's the crucial difference. Genes are causal in the sense that a change in a gene, a mutation, has a statistical consequence in, in an indefinite number of future generations. Now, the reason that matters is that natural selection chooses between alternatives, and the choice between alternatives only matters if it is potentially immortal, or at least if it goes on for a very large number of generations. The neo-Darwinian theory, which Dennis has a lot of criticism of in his, in his book, is a theory of differential survival of genes in gene pools, and that only matters if the genes are potentially able to survive in the gene pool for a very long time. The ones that do survive are the ones that are that have a beneficial causal influence on everybody in which they find themselves. Successive generations, the genes find themselves in bodies again and again. The ones that su survive over many generations will be the ones that have a causal influence on a long succession of bodies. And now I'll shut up. Amazing. Dennis, yes. well, I, I, I love that introduction, Richard, because 30 years ago I did precisely that experiment. Let's go through it carefully because I think the experiment is important. Um, this was work done with my colleague from Italy, Dario Di Francesco. And what we discovered in that work about 30 years ago was that a particular protein, and therefore the gene, it's an HCN protein, so it's an HCN gene, that was responsible for the great majority of the cardiac rhythm actually can be knocked out or the protein blocked and hardly any change in rhythm. Now, I'll tell you something else that I think is very important to this debate. That's what the great majority of genome sequencing and genome association studies have shown. The association levels between the cock crow <laughs> and the, the bell, or whatever it was, I've forgotten now. And um, the association levels are actually generally, with a few outlier genes that are very clearly um, terribly important to the organism, they can be overridden by the rest of the organism, you see. And that's exactly what was happening in our cardiac pacemaker work. What we showed is uh, the rhythm goes like that. I, in, uh, that's what's happening in your heart now. And uh, it goes with a particular frequency. Let's give it 80, 80 beats per minute. You block this particular component, which we know as a matter of physiology contributes 80% 
of the rhythm generating electric current. And you knock it out, there's hardly any change in frequency. Now, I think what is happening is that organisms are terribly robust. They know how to manage with whatever genes they happen to have. So uh, what I think is happening there is simply that another network is operating. We actually have identified that network too, so we, we've done all of those <laughs> experiments already. And I think the genome-wide association study people have done this endlessly uh, during the period in which, for what is it now, about 20 years of genome sequencing. And what we find is that the actual association levels are quite low. And that, I think, is also important as a practical consequence, because that's the reason why we don't have all the medications that were promised when the first human genome sequence was announced in uh, great fanfares on both sides of the Atlantic um, in around 2000, with the great nature paper of 2001. And that takes me on to another thing that I'd like to put to Richard, which is this. I think the evidence that, as you put it, the organism has gone in and changed its genes is evident in that 2001 Nature paper on the human genome sequencing. If you all want to look it up on your mobile phones, it's figure 42. <laughs> and what figure 42 shows is very interesting indeed. They looked at the sequences for two major groups of proteins, the chromatins and, and transcription factors. And what they found was astonishing. When you look at the domains, obviously you can look at it either as a genome sequence or as protein domains that are coded for by those genome sequences, what you find is that whole domains have been pulled apart and put back together. And slowly there's an accretion of these domains. Now, I think you, Richard, did the best calculation on this many years ago. I think it was in Was the Watchmaker, uh, the Watchmaker Blind. Um, very good book, incidentally. I'm full of praise of your writing, too. Um, the, you did the calculations that show how improbable it would be that, for example, the sentence, methinks it is like a weasel, would arise by pure chance. And what you think you, I think you did there was to show beautifully with a mathematical model that if you held the various bits that had been shown to be correct, you would get there very quickly. And I think that's what organisms have been doing with their genes, you see. I think they do go in. I think that later on in the discussion, I'll explain the mechanism by which they do exactly what you're asking for. How do they go in to the nucleus and tell the nucleus what to do? I love the way you put that, Richard, you see. <laughs> so I think you were absolutely right, but probably for the wrong reasons. <laughs> Yes, well, <coughs> now, Dennis, you're talking about something very interesting, which is the robustness of, yes, of or right. organisms yes. and the ability to, yeah. um, as it were, manipulate and change things. Um, and that is a wonderful fact from an embryological point of view, from an epigenetic point of view. Um, but nevertheless, in the long run, as an evolutionist, in the long run, as the generations go by, no matter how clever, even if organisms do, do change what effect genes have, and I'm sure they do, nevertheless, in the long run, what matters is changes in gene frequencies in populations. And I'm talking as an evolutionist now, not as a physiologist or as an embryologist. Perhaps we could say that genes do two quite different things. In embryology, what they do is influence phenotypes in highly complicated ways, including the ways you've just enunciated. But from an evolutionary point of view, what matters is the ones that are still here 10,000 years hence. Uh, you actually use the, the rather, rather vivid um, Im image, I think you said somewhere. Yes, um, 10,000 years to keep a genome in that's a That's right. In a if, you, if, you, if, you if you were to put a yes. genome, <laughs> suppose so you put Dennis's genome in a Petri dish. That's right, yes. Um, and and keep it um, going for, for 10,000 years. Well, it wouldn't keep going, it would decay, as you, as, as you rightly say. However, the information it could be preserved on paper. You could actually write it down on a, on a, in a book. On a, on a, you could carve the A, T, C, and G um, I co codons in granite and, and keep it for 10,000 years. 
and then in 10,000 years type it into a sequencing machine, which we already have, and it would recreate an identical twin oh, of no, Dennis don't Noble. No, I don't think it would. You, you don't think it would? No, no. Uh, why not? Well, it would... <laughs> <laughs> it would need one. It would need uh, uh, an egg cell. Uh, oh, of course it would. No, yeah. no. Yes, yes. yes. Oh. I think we need <laughs> <laughs> the egg cell. Yes. In in t in, t in ten thousand years, yes. they will they will have the technology It'd to take to an egg cell. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, and I, I now therefore need to follow up on a, a, a different issue then, if I may, Richard. Yes, um, because you see, y what it would need to be is a good self replicator. And you won't be surprised that I disagree with you on self-replication, because I think that's a central feature. Uh, because I think without the self-replicator, I'm not quite sure that I understand what the selfish gene idea really means. Now, let me just explain briefly why it can't be a self-replicator. The, the way in which that arose goes way back to the quantum mechanics pioneer, Erwin Schrödinger, who in 1942 gave lectures in uh, the university, well not the university, the Institute of Advanced Studies in Dublin. He published it. And what he said in that book was very insightful. It was that whatever the genetic material was, whether it was DNA, protein, or whatever, it would be found to be a highly accurately reproduced molecular sequence. And he called that an aperiodic crystal. The word crystal matters there, because you see, what you say, Richard, in your books, is that it replicates much as a crystal does. Now, I think that's partly true, but unfortunately not sufficiently true. Because what exactly happens, let's just go through it, and it's got to be technical for about uh, 20 seconds or so. Um, what actually happens is, as we all know, the double helix discovered by Watson and Crick um, and Rosalind Franklin, you remember those images mm -hmm. that were produced yeah. by, <laughs> I see all the women and a few men clapping, <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, what Rosalind was working on, very interesting fact, was not a crystal. Her work in that critical working out of the double helix was actually on the flexible thread that actually is the DNA in a cell. You can crystallize DNA, that was done much later, but not in a living cell, otherwise you can never read it. Now, why is the crystal me metaphor accurate to some degree, but not to sufficient degree? And it's worth just going through the figures because they're very important. What happens as the double helix unwinds is a C finds its mate because it naturally likes the other one that it likes to come in and link to it. And the same applies to the T and, and, the G and so on. So every one of them has a mate. That's fine. Now, that is a pure chemistry thing. And you could say that's almost like a crystal forming itself, because what crystals do is that the other molecules that are in solution like to, in a lock and key fashion, go into the crystal. That's all fine. So in the same kind of way, and I think this is the reason why people like Richard say it is a self-replicator and rely on the molecular biology to say that, they're quite right up to a point. Now the question is up to what point? In all chemical reactions, there's an energy of formation and breakage. And from that, you know how frequently it will go wrong. It's about, in the case of the nucleotides, it's about one in 10,000 nucleotides. Now, you might think that's fine. If you wrote a scientific article of 10,000 words, and you had only one word as a typo, you would be very pleased. <laughs> but the trouble is, that suffices for small viruses, like coronavirus, because a, a mutation rate of 1 in 10,000 each time it's copied would be acceptable if you've only got, say, 10 or 20 or 30,000 as a, as a genome length. We have got 3 billion, and the difference is around a million fold. Now, how accurate is DNA replication? Obviously, that first stage, which is crystal-like, and I accept the metaphor there, is accurate up to about 1 in 10 to the 4. 
What is the accuracy when the cell actually divides and provides two new cells? It's one in ten to the ten. Hardly a single... Uh, that's rather like a proofreader of 10,000 books, going through 10,000 books and making sure there's not a single error in the whole 10,000 books. How is that achieved? It's utterly amazing. It's achieved by the living cell. Because what then happens as the problem of the breakages, as we might call them, in the DNA formation from the double helix when it's unwound, what then happens is a whole army of enzymes go in and literally proofread the mistakes. And I only know, I mean, that's why I say you'd have to put my genome in 10,000 years uh, hence in <laughs> into a, a living cell to do it. Now the question is, which living cell? Um, because, you see, that will provide all the material initially to enable it to be reproduced. So what I'm saying is that it cannot be a faithful replicator except in the presence of its vehicle, which is the living cell. So I don't think there can be a neat separation between the replicator and the vehicle. Proofreading is, of course, very important, and uh, that, that is one of the ways in which it's true that self-replication happens. What matters from an evolutionary point of view is that certain genes survive in the gene pool and others don't. Now, the proofreading is very important. That helps th the thing along. But what matters from the evolutionary point of view is the survival or non-survival in the gene pool of successful genes versus unsuccessful genes. Successful genes are the ones which statistically have a positive effect on their own survival through gene pools. And the way they do that is via their phenotypic effects, their effects upon a succession of bodies. In any particular body, we have a combination of good genes and bad genes, successful and unsuccessful, and the body will die or not depending upon um, all sorts of factors. It may get struck by lightning, it may be eaten by a lion and wasn't look looking and so on. But on average, if a gene is successful, that what that means is that it has a beneficial effect upon a large number of bodies in which it, in which it finds itself. M very often it will find itself in the company of bad genes and then it will die anyway. But statistically, on average, certain genes will get through the 10,000 year time of the p of more than 10,000 years, millions of years, will get through uh, all those generations because of its average statistical effect upon a whole lot of bodies. And uh, others will not get through because of their average statistical effect upon a whole lot of bodies. That is natural selection. That is why animals are so good at what they do. It's why birds are so good at flying. It's why moles are so good at digging. It's why fish are so good at swimming. It's because of the average statistical effects of a whole lot of genes working together in concert with one another to make good phenotypes. And so all the complications of what's going on inside the body in embryology, all the proofreading, all the interactions, all the things that Dennis describes so wonderfully in his book, are completely irrelevant if what you care about is the survival over many generations of certain genes rather than, rather than other genes. Yes, I, I, I fully understand what you're saying, Richard, but I don't think you really answered my point because, you see, I was saying that none of that would happen without the cooperation at the least, and I would say the very active cooperation of the living cell, because as I said, it's only a living cell that can reproduce accurately. Yes. Now, I think what, what, what we need to do here is to get another element into this, because I think what you're really worried about is how can it be uh, that the body can actually change the genome? And that's the big question. Now, the reason we know that it can is that it, we know it controls it. That's the first step. So let's see, first of all, how that can be done. I've two very important colleagues have done the work I'm going to describe, so I'm going to credit them. 
Um, Dick Chen worked with me as a graduate student way back in the 1960s and is now working at the New York University of New York and um, has done part of the experiments I'm going to describe. And Anant Parekh, who is uh, a physiologist in the same department of, uh, as me in Oxford. And what they've done is absolutely beautiful. They've asked the question, you see, it's the relevant question that I think Richard is asking. How can it be that the surface of the body or of a cell, it might be that it's a unicellular organism, then it would be the surface of the organism. How can it know, how can its nucleus know that there is a need to change? And we now know how that can be done. What they've shown is best described by imagining, first of all, that a single nucleotide is about the size of my fist. And it's, set, it's situated in the nucleus. So let's put that in the center of the cell. If we did that, on that scale, the surface membrane of that cell would be way up in Scotland. How on earth can it be that a signal through a receptor on the surface can influence a nucleus. And we now know how that can be done. What they both found doing different experiments in different cells was that calcium coming through protein channels in that surface membrane using the same metaphor way, way up, up there in Scotland creates a calcium concentration in a small subspace underneath the membrane and that High calcium triggers a chemical reaction that produces a messenger. And that messenger gets attached to some extremely important proteins in the cell. Those proteins are called tubulins. And the name suggests what they do. They form tubes. Literally, there are tube trains in cells. And I'm not joking, because what happens is those tubulins run all the way through from one edge of the cell to another. They have little motors on them, little molecular motors, and they can attach a messenger molecule to the motor. And what then happens is phenomenal. They literally walk along the tubulin. It takes just a few seconds to go from that surface, imagine on this scale, way up there in Scotland, to the nucleus. What does it do? In those experiments, it changes the gene expression levels in the relevant genes that matter for that particular function. Now, the only thing that's missing here, and I'm sure Richard will pick this up very quickly, so I'll say it myself, <laughs> is that uh, those are very recent experiments done 2016 and more recently 2018, I think it was. Anyway, the important point is that we don't yet know how that induces genome change. And I really mean actual change in DNA. And yet we know also that those processes must be able to do that because we can show that. Let's take a tumor developing your body. And it's a bad situation. You're beginning to get metastasis. So the doctors get out the radiotherapy and the chemotherapy, they attack it and try to destroy it. What happens? The tumor cells themselves tell the genome to increase the mutation rate. How can they do that? Precisely by the kinds of mechanisms I've just described. Because the mutation rate is under the control of what is happening in the body as a whole. What then happens is phenomenal. It happens in your immune system all, all the time. It happens in bacteria all the time because they change uh, their genomes in response to antibiotics. And what they do is very simple. You remember that difference between 1 in 10 to the 4 and 1 in 10 to the 10? That depends, as I said, on the cell. Having these repair mechanisms, the proofreading mechanisms, but you see, they can be down-regulated. That process can be down-regulated. And what that does is to produce literally millions of new DNA sequences. That can then be selected. Now, the selection, and I agree there is a kind of natural selection here within the organism. Now the question is very simple. Do those new, se new sequences get to the germline? You bet they do. And that, I'm afraid, is where I think the big hole in the theory lies. 
because once you can do that, you can get what, for example, Zhang and his colleagues have shown in a paper published in 2018. I can send all these references to anybody who sends me an email. So if you're worried about whether I'm telling the truth, just send an email <laughs> and I will send you the reference. What they showed was that a small non-coding RNA, that's a little bit of technology, but a new, a new sequence generated by the organism can pass to the germline cells, which become eventually, of course, the eggs and the sperm. And what that will do is then tell the next generation to inherit the metabolic characteristics that were conveyed by that. I'm, I'm sorry to say this because I know this is a dirty word amongst most evolutionary biologists, but Lamarck is back. Very simple. Oof. All right. right. By the way, the, um, the, 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 the walking mechanism is simply beautiful. It and is. You can, you absolutely. can see, see films of yes. it. Of it. It's, yes. Yes. it's, it's un incredible. absolutely uncanny. Yes. Yeah. Um, at, at one point, Dennis, I thought you were confusing um, gene expression, which of course is mm. obvious. I mean, yes, it happens all, yes, all the time. Yes, indeed. No, it didn't confuse with, them. With germline changes. We don't um, I, that's why we w I went on to explain exactly. how those yeah. changes can then be communicated um, to the germline. That, that, yes. That's an extremely yes. important yes. distinction. Indeed, um, yeah. There's, there's no, no dispute whatever about uh, certain genes being turned on in some cells and others in other cells. That's, that's what embryology is all about. However, what Dennis went on to say is that there's evidence that it actually gets into the germline right. and um, Lamarck is back. Uh, well, if Lamarck is back um, in, if for an indefinite number of generations, I'm impressed. Um, if it's only for a couple of generations, I'm not. Um, but let's suppose that it is for a, for a larger number of generations. If that's true, then I would have to revise what I say to include any change in the germline then now, now becomes admitted into the charm circle of replicators. And that's fine. Well, it would, uh, yes. Um, I doubt it. But I know you do. But I don't want to be dogmatic about saying that the, that the, the DNA in the existing germline is all there ever was. If on some other planet, and maybe on this planet, it's true that the germline can be altered, then that's fine. We inc we the, th the, the broad church of the selfish gene can embrace that. Um, <laughs> as I say, I doubt it. Yes, okay. Um, yes, but look, d d d Richard, I think the one thing to, to perhaps make clear to the audience is this is happening in everybody in this room because we had the pandemic that arrived with coronavirus. Now, of course, we've fortunately uh, developed vaccines uh, against the virus, and that's been our great saving uh, grace. But what would have happened anyway, with a lot of people dying, of course, would have been that our um, immune systems would have done exactly what we're describing. That is, they would have used that mechanism for hypermutating, that is, mutating extremely quickly to produce millions of new DNA sequences. And then that is used to be what then uh, gives you the immunity, the acquired immunity, obviously. Now, what Richard is questioning is, okay, maybe that can occasionally be passed to the germline, we don't know that yet, whether an immune response can be passed to the germline, and I would readily say we don't know that yet. But what is important is Richard's point about how temporary it is. Now, it's very important indeed, and I agree with Richard about the importance of temporariness or permanence, because it seems to me that what these mechanisms give is the option for the evolutionary process to, as it were, try it out. If there's an environmental change that makes it very difficult to survive and all organisms are under stress and they alter their genomes and pass some of that even temporarily on to the next generations, what the next generations can do is to find out whether they do experience that change in environment or not. If they don't, then it's great that it's temporary. You don't have to alter the main genome. If it is more or less permanent and goes on for many generations, then how can it get assimilated in the genome? 
Conrad Waddington showed how to do that way back in the 1950s. Incidentally, his book, The Strategy of the Genes, has been rightly republished in 2014, so you, you can buy it again. It was published in 1957. He did beautiful experiments on fruit flies. He induced changes with very tiny, gentle persuasion, as it were, from either heat or ether or some other um, experimental techniques in which he could as it were, persuade a few of the fries to, f to show a new characteristic. And he actually determined how many generations would you have to continue to do that in order for it to become assimilated into the genome. It's about 14. It's not very long. Now, what he was showing is what he called genetic assimilation. I think it was a great mistake that Waddington was ignored by the evolutionary but biologists, and that's a shame. The Waddington effect was actually selection. I mean, it, 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 it was not Lamarck. By him. Well, the, the, f the flies that didn't respond correctly to the heat shock yes. died. Yes, that's right. And so yes. it was selection. It, wa yeah, it was yes. Darwinian. I, I'm agreeing with you. It Richard. only looked like Lamarck. This may be the only point in the evening where we totally agree. <laughs> that was selection. <laughs> yes, I absolutely agree. I'm agreeing with you. What Waddington was doing was a simulation of a Lamarckian experiment for quite a different reason. And I think it comes back to your opening question to, to me. Do you still hold to the idea that it's agency that organisms have rather than a DNA? Now I do, because you see, I think what organisms are doing is partly through their social choices effectively choosing which genes they will allow to survive. That's what Waddington so was doing Social too. Social selection, yes. G how? I mean, uh, well, who you mate with, for example. We're back to Darwin's idea of sexual selection. Well, we are. Of the social we selection so ideas. So why, why drag Lamarck in then? I think that's Lamarckian uh, because it's part of the use within the social context. You see, what, what Lamarck was insisting on um, was the idea that use and disuse was itself something that could be inherited. And I think this is something, of course it starts culturally, but it becomes something that can be inherited through the fact that you are, as organisms, choosing the characteristics that you want to survive in the later generations. Why do we marry anybody? Isn't that why we do it? <laughs> but Dennis, you're, I mean, Th this, this is perfectly Darwinian, what you're talking about. Yes, absolutely, I agree. And Darwinian, Darwin was a Lamarckian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, not joking. No, you're not. He, no, he, in okay. 1868, he published his theory of gemules, which is precisely the thing we've now discovered as the extracellular vesicles today. So I absolutely totally agree with you, Richard. Darwin <laughs> was indeed a Lamarck, and I'm a good Darwinian. <laughs> You're a sixth edition Darwinian. <laughs> <laughs> um, da Darwin, in the sixth edition of The Origin of Species, did uh, flirt with Lamarckism, that is true. Um, that's a historical fact, but uh, it's not a very important biological fact. Oh, I think and it's extremely uh, um, important. Okay, well... <laughs> um, but no, seriously, Richard, because he, he, he collaborated with... This is not very well known. He collaborated with physiologists in the last 20 years of his life, between 1872 and 1882. He collaborated with my predecessor as the chair of physiology, um, Burden Sanderson, and he collaborated with his student, George Romanes, in a very simple set of experiments, because you see, he took Lamarckianism so seriously that he invented this theory of gemules, and I'd better just very briefly explain what that is. He realized, as Richard has beautifully explained, that you've got to explain how it can be that the body can, in its changes due to use and disuse, communicate any of that to the germline. Otherwise, all of that information, as Richard beautifully expressed it earlier on, would be lost. So how can that be communicated? He couldn't see what could possibly do that, so he invented an idea, and he admitted it was an idea, which was that tiny particles put out by the cells themselves, which he called gemules, would be able, perhaps, to pass through the bloodstream down to the germline. That was his way of explaining there could be soma to germline expression. But he readily admitted at the time this was just a hypothesis because he couldn't see them. Now, with 19th century microscopy, indeed you could not. 
the 20th century microscopy and 21st century microscopy even better, we've been able to do so. And it's the experiments are simply beautiful. Just go online and ask to look at extracellular vesicles um, made evident by labeling molecules fluorescently. So they literally glow green, yellow, red, or whatever it might be. It enables you to know this is this particular RNA, this is this particular DNA, and so on. And that escapes the limits of light microscopy. You can actually resolve down to very tiny particles indeed. They're called extracellular vesicles. Those have been shown experimentally to be passed to the germline. That's how the RNAs and DNAs, the new RNAs and DNAs, get to the germline. So I think that if he was alive today, I think Charles Darwin would be praising and cheering the discovery of extracellular vesicles. They are his gemules, and they carry out the function that Darwin proposed. Now, why did he spend the last 20 years of his life collaborating with George Romanes? Is because he actually thought this must be right. So I don't think it's trivial that Darwin was a Lamarckian. Okay, I, think, I do think this is actually quite misleading. Um, what Darwin's gemules were supposed to be about was investigating the, the current state of the body and passing it on to the next generation. So the gemules yes. were going all, all around the body and they were yes, right. um, detecting changes in the body. Um, the sort of classic Lamarckian examples like the blacksmith's arms getting muscular and the giraffe's neck stretching and things like that. Um, L Lamarck thought that those were inherited. Darwin, in his later years, thought they were too. Uh, and um, the gemul Darwin's gemules were going around the body in the bloodstream and picking up information about the current state of the body, the modified state of the body, the acquired state of the body, and going to the germline, going to the gonads, and imprinting the information into the germline. Now, that is a very radical idea. It's precisely it's what the extracellular vesicles are doing. Well, yes, but, but they're not... It's nothing to do with blacksmith's arms. It's, 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 it's the, they may be doing something... If you're right about the immune system, I mean, you seem to be suggesting that what happens is that when, when the immune, immune system uh, reacts to an infection like COVID yeah. and... Um, and we become I immune to it. That immunity gets passed on. No, I, no, I deliberately said we're not yet sure about that. I know so you did, no, and, and no. I'm glad you but said that. But what we are sure mm. about is that other things are passed on. Metabolic disorders are passed on, and sexual preference are passed on. Well, sexual, again, prefer I've got the references. sexual preferences in what, in what way passed on? I, it's passed on in planarians, and that's been demonstrated. Again, all of these references, I'm very happy for people to email me and ask for them, um, but that's been shown very recently by Toker and his collaborators in work in Israel, and I think that is actually a 2021 reference. And, and how many generations? <laughs> well, what they're showing, okay, uh, come back to the point I made about temporary and permanent, uh, because you see, temporary is actually an advantage if you don't yet know from an evolutionary perspective whether the change is valuable or not. I think it's great, you see, that epigenetic changes and, and temporary alterations of the germline are not necessarily passed on through many, many thousands of generations, because if the change in the environment is, is really temporary, you don't want a permanent response. So I can see the evolutionary logic of doing it in that kind of way. You keep it soft until it needs to become hard, and then you let it become hard. You let it then become assimilated into the genome. Well, that's fine. I mean, that, that, that's coming back to the Waddington effect in a, w uh, in a way. To some extent, yeah. Richard, yes. I think this is why I said that Waddington was um, pa badly ignored. Yes. Uh, or, or sometimes called the Baldwin effect. Uh, sometimes called that, um, yes. <laughs> But I think what, what's happened today is that we actually now know the precise mechanisms by which it can happen. We know the molecular biology of it. We know the cellular biology of it. So what I'm saying is it's time for evolutionary biology to catch up. I mean, yeah. if I may ask yes. in that case, how long would it need to be? I mean, you've asked a few times. I, I'm really taken by this sort of temporal thing. How long would it need to be to have an effect, do you think? 
in order to be evolutionarily interesting, then it, it, it needs to be um, something that y we, we see as a change in the gene pool. Um, and a uh, change in the gene pool would be, would be, I mean, I can't put an actual number of generations on it, but, but it's, 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 it's not a proper Darwinian change if it's just, um, uh, for example, the, the there's, a, there's, I there's evidence that starvation effects yes, can... I was going to ask can, about um, that next, yes. And the, these are, um, uh, as it were, I mean, epigenetic effects are, are, are changes in the, as the embryo develops, changes in the expression of genes mm -hmm. in different parts of the body. So in, in liver cells, certain genes are turned on in kidney cells, other genes are turned on muscle cells, uh, other genes are turned on. Those are epigenetic effects. Now there is some evidence that those epigenetic changes can be inherited into the next generation and possibly the grandchild generation. That's not a, a, a proper gene pool change. Yeah, I think Richard is right on that, but what we would need to do is to look at the effects after billions of years. And that's exactly what the Human Genome Project did in its Nature paper of 2001. Remember I referred to figure 42 of that paper. You see there the evidence that those genomes were changed by moving great chunks around in the genome. It's not time, I guess, to go through the detail of that, yeah, but unfortunately that, not. that's fairly clear evidence that it must have happened mm -hmm. during evolutionary time scale. Fascinating. It, it's obviously also important to say that increasingly with modern technologies, people are starting to look at sort of the genomes of um, other humanoid species and, and looking so, into yes. the past to sort of get more information on, on perhaps what our more recent ancestors look like. And it might be quite interesting to sort of see whether or not that those pieces of data can, can add to, to, to this conversation in, in due course. What, what bothers me is, is D Dennis is saying Lamarck is back because, because in, in order for Lamarck to be back, it seems to me we would need to have something more like the blacksmith's arms effect. Where, where an adaptation, and I mean, there are plenty of adaptations that happen in lifetime. You, your muscles develop when you, when you use them. It would be wonderful, maybe on some other planet, it happens that when your muscles develop, when you're, 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 you get a suntan, when you're, when you're all, all sorts of adaptive changes like that get inherited. And that's what Lamarck was suggesting. And I think to say that Lamarck is back is, is going to give a misleading impression because people will think you're saying that something like the giraffe effect, the, the blacksmith's yeah, arms effect. I think what I, uh, be, be very precise, it is that the inheritance of use and disuse is now evident. That's the way I would well, put it. Well, yes. is it? I mean, you're not going to go out and say that, that, that adaptation as we see it in the field, as, as animals develop camouflage, as animals develop stronger bones as they as they use them stronger muscles as they use them that would be a proper lamarckian effect that would be a real adaptive change as a consequence and we of know use and disuse when we know that the rnas that communicate all of that can be transmitted to the germline oh my gosh so we've got part of the evidence that of obviously i mean what i would want to say on this is this is open field for experimentation in the future. Mm. That's what we need. We need well, to be open to those possibilities. On that delightful note, please can we take a moment to appreciate the civility and eloquence with which these two gentlemen have debated <laughs> and disagreed this moment. Can you sign my book, Dennis? Oh my gosh, <laughs> look oh at yeah. that. Will you sign my book? <laughs> look at this. I, I mean, this is fantastic. Look at this. <laughs> And that is how it's done. <laughs> Fabulous.